From time to time, we bring you a repeat show. This is an episode from our extensive back catalogue, resurfacing some of the ideas and thoughts from the past that we believe are still relevant and well worth revisiting. UX Podcast Episode 297 Hi, and welcome to UX Podcast, balancing business, technology, and people every other Friday from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm James Roy Lawson. And I'm Per Axbom. And today we have Jonas Söderström. Uh, he's been on the show, and you, you know all the numbers, always as always, James. What show number was he on? 32. 32. Oh, that's a long time ago. <laughs> oh, it's a serious long time ago. It's, um, it's actually pretty much exactly four years ago. It was December 2012. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Which is which, which is a long time. And um, I actually listened back at the episode before we um, talked to him this time, and oh, we're, we're better podcasters now. Perhaps, yeah, our you. sound is a bit better than four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so Jonas Söderström, he's the author of Stupid Bloody System. Uh, the English version isn't quite out yet. Uh, I don't believe. Is he doing one? Yes, he's doing one. I mean, that's. Oh, oh, so cool. many people people have asked him to do one. So he's, yeah, he's doing one. I, I've I've been asking him for. I mean, it's, to give some backstory, um, Jonas wrote um, um, the Swedish version of Stupid Bloody System. Um, well, five years ago, yeah, I believe now. And it's an absolutely fantastic book, mm. um, giving um, stories and examples of how um, the the stupid bloody systems that we have to use um, cause not just usability problems, but also physical um, stress and illness. Exactly, like burnouts uh, and, and just people calling in sick because they can't handle the systems. And he's also written uh, a book about web copy and he's uh, writing a book about the Swedish blogosphere. So he, he, I mean, he's an old timer in the Swedish usability industry or or branch. Or And uh, I mean, he still calls himself an information architect, which I kind of respect. Uh, mm. It's also cool. He was also uh, actually brought onto a governmental task force working with uh, usability and accessibility in the digital er- digital area uh, in 2012. So he's he's well well respected in the field, and uh, it'll be really really interesting talking to him today. Yeah, I wonder, you know, have things improved in the four years since we <laughs> talked to him last? I, I seriously doubt it. <laughs> uh, let's 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 find out. <laughs> So we've had our fair share of technical glitches uh, just before this interview. It's just been insane. It took us half an hour to set up, which is just crazy. Uh, and both our kids called, James and my kid, uh, asking us about technical stuff at home. And for me, this is kind of symbolic for what we're about to talk to Yunus about. Is I mean, all these, the complexity of it all, it's all becoming so complex in the world. And at the same time, all this technology is so vulnerable. So what can we do about it? What's the problem what, and what should we be doing, Jonas? Yeah. <laughs> Huge quest- question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, uh, well, the first thing I think is that we have to be aware that we're adding complexity at an unprecedented pace mm-hmm. now. And we see it in, in, in the vulnerabilities. We see it in the... Uh, I mean, the attacks on on uh, all kind of networked items. Um, there was a report the other day that Sweden alone suffers like a thousand attacks uh, on vital systems each month from the, hmm. from the... Each month? Yeah, each month. Okay. From the defense... Well, one of the defense agencies that, that monitors um, yeah. cyber attacks and IT attacks. And, and I mean that's just the attacks, and we uh, we we were certainly not under attack from some <laughs> foreign power here. Yeah. <laughs> when well, we had un- it. unless we class Netflix and uh, my, my my son watching Danger Mouse, <laughs> right? Well, big attack on our bandwidth. <laughs> okay, yeah, but but um, the complexity of things makes it very very vulnerable, uh, and we we're not really prepared for that. I think, um, and we have to rethink. Some of the strategies we have to rethink. Some of the 
um, things we take for granted about efficiency and productivity and, and so on. That's, that's one of my pet peeves right now. Mm. We um, don't seem to get all the productivity out of the new digital environment, the new digital ecosystems, the new, all the new di digital uh, systems that we add that we should get or that we mm. assume that we should get. Uh, the productivity gains are, are flattening out, actually. So, well, even okay. even yeah. um, it's in, interesting when you say that. It's, it's even the the way that we measure and we just talk about the productivity gains. I think ignores the reality of many of these situations. Um, it's like recently, my my, my wife got a, a new laptop um, through work because, of course, it's it's it'd be more productive for them to have new laptops because their old laptops were on their knees and you know were three years old and had so many Windows updates. They just were losing so many hours. They'd worked out the they'd calculated how many hours they were losing because mm. of the old laptops. But they don't calculate how many hours they lose um, and how much stress they cause by changing them. And things aren't syncing like they used to. Mm. Uh, you don't know where all the settings are because it's three years since you changed it last time. Um, you, you, you have to have help from your husband to install <laughs> things because the IT department doesn't support certain things. Mm. And, and when you're at home or working from somewhere else, it's, it's complicated. It is, and and there's probably a net gain in there anyway, but it's certainly yeah. smaller than we think, and smaller than it should be, and and so the, it's. I think that in many respects uh, regarding IT, we're on sort of the curve of diminishing returns. Uh, we don't follow the Moore's law like whew, right mm. up in the sky. We're we're mm. on another curve and. The, that's a curve of diminishing returns. It's flattening out. Um, and that's not strange because that's the thing, that's the way almost everything behaves in the world. And it would be strange if not digital, the digital uh, domain actually behaved in the same way. I mean, it's like antibiotics. You, you get, at first you get a huge effect. You get a huge advantage from, from uh, using antibiotics and then it flattens out and and if you use it too much it's, it's <laughs> it could even be dangerous mm. yeah. well, it's interesting though because i mean that is one of the most for one of the foremost arguments for implementing it solutions is we are making it more efficient and we're yeah. making people more productive and the in the end we are not doing that and sometimes you think of ux as as the domain where people will take care of this and and cater to people's needs and understand the challenges. And it seems that we aren't really doing that. We're actually making it worse in some cases because we're adding features and adding functionality and, and expecting people to spend more time with our systems. Yeah. Um, there, there is, I, I've thought a lot about this mm. sort of productivity paradox and mm. there have been people trying to explain it and try or actually I haven't really managed to explain it, but there are um, several interesting things here. Um, we love to say that we simplify things with IT or with digital systems. That's not actually true anymore. We did that. We used to do that. Mm. I mean, when we started this whole <laughs> uh, revolution, like in the 1940s and in the 1950s, when you replaced uh, clerks and, and people working in the banks where they were... Um, calculating compound interest by hand and we replaced them with computers and machines um yeah, the we, we replaced the abacus we have, exactly we <laughs> replaced the abacus um we made enormous gains in productivity and efficiency mm -hmm. uh and we kept on getting good results for a number of years but uh I, I would say that we're now, in, in many cases, we're now at the point where we don't simplify anymore. We use IT, we use digital systems to be able to do new things. We add things. Mm. Uh, and a lot of these things are, are good I mean, and useful and, 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 and needed, uh, but they're also the case that we add things that are not really useful, not really needed, and that adds to complexity and doesn't give a net return. Yeah. 
Uh, and this is especially true um, in in the workplace, which is my my focus, the focus of my work. Mm. Um, I mean, we we talk about feature creep, and we talk that thing, and we've always sort of uh, thought of that as a feature of of the engineer, of the nerd who who. Um, innovates and <laughs> finds out, oh, we could add all these mm. bells and whistles and we can add these, these, these functions to, to this. What, what, what we have now, I th- would argue, is that we have feature writers or we have feature creep from the organizations or within the organizations. Um, we have different groups, different units in an organization that will all demand their own um, digital system, their own mm. digital device, their own thing. Um, and th- there there we, we have sort of core the, 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 the core of the complexity because all these features, all these devices uh, caters to the need of a small unit or small group in the organization and but not to the in, the entire company and on there. And and so the usefulness for for one small part of the company becomes a, a problem for the system as a whole and the organization as a whole isn't isn't one of the issues i mean i, I think as well about um this the, the enterprise side of things I've, I've been working with an enterprise product now for the last three years um and I, i've been reflecting a fair bit on how you know i'm there as a ux uh, a ux designer and um I've, we're working in agile teams and they're developing and they've got a backlog and they've even got um, you know, some kind of um, product room, I guess, that is driven by the, the product management, uh, which is in its turn is mainly driven by the sales and the requests and demands from customers. So, so you get quite quickly, in, quickly into the into the sales and procurement side of things that what we're doing is we're developing to meet the needs of procurement to mm-hmm. land mm. deals yeah. and um, and when as as you know if we if you have it at a scale and ux is is right at the at the at the, at the end where we're kind of talking about the actual end users the the employees who are going to be using the system we're we're a complete opposite ends of yeah. this um communication um path i guess between mm-hmm. what do we need to do our jobs uh, what what do we want as an organization uh, you know where's the negotiation with sales and procurement and where's product management and where's ux and that's a long distance to travel yeah. do you ever tr- consider the interfaces of the internal users when you develop those systems is that an issue i mean my focus when i'm developing i'm i'm constantly wanting to know what the actual end users are doing and want to do mm. field research yeah. and see what they are and 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 what I find very challenging is um, getting time in, in sprints to develop the, 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 the ideal, the, the actual solution which would match their needs or finding yeah. out what their actual needs are. Yeah. You end up having to back down to something that fits into a sprint. Sometimes that fits into yes. the next release. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something that meets immediate needs as demanded by existing customers, the people who procure the systems rather yeah. than use them. So, so and that's my, that's my experience too. You rarely get the time to develop really good interfaces or good systems for the internal users, for the end users. There, there's so much focus on on the external side or or, or the 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 external interfaces of, of things, and you leave mm. the rest to to your employees to struggle with and, and mm. try to cope mm. with. Isn't that the case? That's that's what happens because that's where I, a place I'm in at right now in the project I've been working on for three years with now is that we've come to a place where we've prioritized the the user, uh, like the uh, end user of a system, but not the, of course the staff working internally at the company. Uh, but there and there's so much UX debt there. But mm. you, everyone's talking about deliverables, mm. and the problem with deliverables is they are something tangible. Mm-hmm. So I, I need something that yeah, I can see that you've done. But there's so much UX debt that we should actually go back and fix stuff yeah. so that people could work more efficiently. But if you do that, there's, no, but there's nothing to show. No. There's nothing to show people. What are you doing? We're fixing that. But you've worked on that two years ago, but why are you working with that now? Mm. So isn't that the problem in essence? That You're not moving ahead. You're not moving forward. 
in my, it seems. Yeah, in my eyes, I'm moving a yeah. lot forward because yeah. that, that means the system will be used maybe five, ten years from now. Yeah. If we Now I'm seeing if we continue at this rate, just building new features and adding complexity, the system will be dead in two years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and I and I see a similar mm-hmm. thing that I, mm-hmm. I kind of you do the you do the kind of grand thinking with the kind of concept mm-hmm. the UX how this would really work well for mm-hmm. the for the end user, mm-hmm. and you you present it everyone thinks this is fantastic mm-hmm. and then they say well but in uh, we need to do something in this sprint, mm-hmm. uh, and and then you kind of have to boil it down to something which is a uh, which is the minimum you could possibly do mm-hmm. and and still acknowledge that mm-hmm. maybe it's possible for the user to do what they need to do, mm-hmm. and and you get that reply. We can come back to this, and after we've got some more feedback, some more more information, mm. we can come back to this, <laughs> and we can we can redo it in a later mm. sprint. And and I I hate that because experience has told me, like you point out, Pau, that debt's going to stay there until mm. the product gets completely rebuilt from the ground up. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I actually think that we now, in in many cases, we're in the place there we where we should actively try to dismantle some systems so sometimes when i when i work on, on a project it's i i have this dream or or I, when i'm awake I, I i think that i'm in a helicopter sort of hovering about the most complicated intersection of of, of highways like outside los angeles or something like where we have like this complete spaghetti mess mm. and the project manager is shouting in my ear we're going to Make another highway go through all this, <laughs> and it's 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 not sustainable. It's not sustainable. We're, we're we're coming to a place where our digital ecosystems are won't be sustainable, and we have to to scale down. We have to dismantle. We have to try to get old systems out of the way, and and not just piling up more and more and more on on mm. the environment that we that we present to our users, mm-hmm. as, uh, our, our end users and our internal users, or our staff as well, I think. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, that's a challenge because there is this hype now that sort of we'll be saved by more digital. Yeah. You know, digitalization will, will save the day, mm-hmm. will, will, will make us more efficient. And how do you make a business case for dismantling systems? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, actually, you could do that yeah. because if you just measure mm. I mean, the efficiency, if you would measure the efficiency, if you could state to your mm. project that if we do these, this to the back end now, mm. our staff will be 20% more efficient, mm. then it would be like... No case at all. Yeah. No. But we rarely, we rarely, we rarely measure, and we rarely try to to find really the, the most efficient way. Mm. But, but I mean, it, it sounds it sounds so obvious itself, so simple, um, dismantling so on. But when you when you're in a situation where, um, I mean, you've you you've got a product, you've maybe even got a, a legacy version of a product on one platform. You've got a you've got a new version of the product. Uh, maybe that's that's web based, and then you've got existing customers. You've got all these existing organisations, and you're there and you're saying, "Look, we can see from our helicopter position that this would be so much more effective if we we dismantle this and build this, bulldoze everything." <laughs> yeah, you, you know the the colour's going to drain out of people's faces, and they yes, go, "Well, I know we that. have yeah. we can't afford it." Yeah, and it's <laughs> well, you can't afford. Yeah, exactly, but you can't well, afford to have it. it <laughs> It's it's it's, oh. it's a hell of a trap. Yeah, it's a hell mm. of a trap. No, I, I, I that is really a, a very lo- a huge challenge to to try to make sense of this, try to make make uh, a more sustainable environment. Uh, but and I I don't have the recipe for how to do it. But we have to start thinking about it. Uh, yeah, really soon. And ju- yeah, exactly. And just talking about talking it like this, and it. realizing, oh my God, what are we doing? C- because yeah. then you have to realize well, whose responsibility is it. Yeah, and I think it's ours. It should be. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, we have, we have, um, of course, we have all kinds of different digital environments. One of the things I've been working with, and we're working with intranets, mm. is like most internet pro- projects uh, have this, this, this sort of motto that we will replace all the <laughs> these the systems and we will we have the special system for this and special system for that and special system for for this and that mm. and we will all replace and we'll collect them in a new brand new intranet right mm. sounds mm. good yes what what happens is that when you 
then try to take all the small system. You have a small system for procurement or a small system for, for uh, other kinds of data. And so when you try to take them offline, when you try to, to dismantle them, technically, mm. it's often possible. It's often perfectly technically, technically possible to integrate it or, or to, you have it in, in your new internet, something that would replace it. Mm. But when you go to that person in the organization who's responsible or the group that is responsible for that system, they have invested their entire sort of identity in the organization with that system. Mm. We are the ones who uh, run the service portal yeah. Or anything, so to say. Right, and they've been at, and at parties. People have been asking them, "What do you work with?" And that that's their yes, answer. That's, so that's their answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you you go to them and say, "We're going to close down your system," yeah, it's a bit like going to someone and say, "We're going to kill your child." Mm. You're okay mm. with that? Mm. No, of course they're not okay. <laughs> so the so the organization can all, often invent um, reasons for having these. I mean, all these islands. Mm. St st still keep them. We know we can't take that. We need this for that mm. and for that and that. And so you end up, often you end up with the new internet system <laughs> and we have the old, the old ones oh, as yeah. well uh, yeah. still there. Oh my God. So, so it's, um, and then you have, probably have the old internet also mm. uh, online because you can't mm. migrate everything mm. over there. Mm. So, so mm. the, 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 um, the, the good intention of, mm. of Diminishing it, the number of systems and, and concentrated will sort of run into the wall, and you end up with more systems <laughs> than you mm -hmm. had, or mm -hmm. at least not not uh, reaching that point of, of elim eliminating mm -hmm. all the the old systems. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's what I call the feature creep within the mm -hmm. organization. Um, it's 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 an incredibly complex. I'm going to say ecosystem now. Thinking about um, Andrea Rosmini the other week, it's a complex ecosystem of 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 individuals, um, of systems and integrations. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd I'd almost say that it's an, an impossibly complex for for, for individuals mm. to to comprehend. It's it's, mm. it's almost impossibly complex to to understand the the entire system and exactly like you say, Jonas here that we've got individuals behaving. In human ways, this yeah. is my thing, and I and I'm used to this, and I like it, and I don't want you to change it. Then we've got systems behaving in a systematic way, and we're trying to bolt these together with lovely integrations, which another human probably has has created and designed. And exactly. Incredibly complex. Yeah, I mean, we did this. Um, there was a, we ha we had a check at one institution, uh, actually just a library at one of the university hospitals in Sweden, and checking just one day. In uh, there's 110 employees at that library, and in just one day they used a total number of 117 different systems. 117. 117 during just one day. Oh my God. Uh, which means that that's not the complete list. So, had we looked for two days, we would probably have seen like 130 systems yeah. used. Had we stayed there for three days, it would have been 150 systems in total. Mm. Mm. So, so um, and of course, it's just a couple of them, four or five, that are used uh, every day by almost everyone, or, or, or at least every other day. So that's core like system core f five or four or six core systems and then there are like 112 113 systems <laughs> that are used uh by by say 10 or 15 people each day mm. uh but there's 10 or 15 different people each day so you that's that's a system that you come back to, uh, to perhaps once a month or mm. or two times a year or something like mm. that uh, and that that is the challenge for the individual because you you constantly get in touch with these systems that are not very familiar to you. You need that you only meet once or twice a year, and you you're, you're um, asking yourself, well, how did I how did I handle this system? What was mm -hmm. the login here? What kind of format should I enter here? I mean, all these things that mm -hmm. that we are familiar with as as UXers mm -hmm. that that. that uh, that's the problem with with many systems when they're not standardized in in, in a way. Mm -hmm. no. But the other hand, the other thing is that when you have one hundred seventeen system, 
and they are integrated with each other. They are connected. Not all, 117 mm. perhaps, but many of them are integrated. And that's, I mean, that's the driving force behind much of IT development to integrate these systems. Mm. If you add uh, the 118th system, mm. how many possible connections do you end up with? Ooh, I did this experiment because when we were getting our second child, I was looking at how many communication points do you have between mm. all the members of the family. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it increases exponentially, of course, well, with, every, with, every exponentially, system, yeah. with every system you add. Exactly. And yeah. uh, so you end up actually 6,903 yeah. possible connections <laughs> when you have 118. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and it, of course, all the 118 systems will not be connected to each other. But let's say we just have 10% yeah. of that amount. Uh, that's 690 possible points of friction. Mm. Mm. 690 possible points where things could go wrong. Mm. And it's, like you say, it's almost impossible for a human to to fathom, to... to, to, to yeah, to 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 um, understand this, mm. and just that, just, that's, just that's testing, that's just testing. What new, if you're going to have an upgrade to one of those systems, mm. yeah, just the po the post soil charged with the task of 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 packaging that upgrade and testing it's going to be okay. I mean, it's 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 an exactly. endless number of combinations yes. to test, so you're never going to know really. Yes, and when you have 118 system. Each one of these systems will be upgraded some t during one week, or, or uh, some some system will be upgraded during uh, uh, a random week. So mm. you will have constant upgrades. You will have constant disturbances in the system. Mm. So that's mm. why we're building the 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 you know the, we have the what is called the Metcalfe's law. Uh, if you're familiar with that, that's that's stating that the value of a network rises exponentially with the number of devices um, mm. connected mm. to the network. And the classic example is that if w when we have w only one fax machine, it's worthless, and we have two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Pat and I can communicate, <laughs> but it's not very much. But when we have a lot of fax machines or telephones, um, the value increases mm. because you can. And, and the, the, there, is, there is an evil twin of Metcalfe's law, mm. And it's that the more devices you have connected, the, the more vulnerable uh, the network also is. And it's especially true mm. because the original Metcalfe's law, law talks about identical devices. Yes, I was just going to mm. mention this. Yes. You, it, it All only works. machines. <laughs> yeah. And now we have networks where you yes. connect thousands of different kinds of devices, like mm. the problems we had when running up to this here. Mm. Um, mm. So, So... Uh, the vulnerabilities um, add up and the inefficiencies build mm. up and the, the complexities uh, build up in, a, in an unprecedented way. And unfortunately, I think that, that a lot of people that uh, make decisions, politicians or, or leaders in, in companies, they don't understand the exponential rise of the complexity. They see just we add, it should be simple, we add just one system. Yeah. And it should actually be simpler to, mm. to add the 118th system mm. because uh, like if you're, you're a carpenter, like right, making your 118th mm. chair would be much more mm. easy than, than making your first or second. Mm. But we're, we're on a different scale and we're on a different uh, trajectory. So mm. uh, I'm, I, I'm going to put it to you th um, that the solution maybe to this isn't, we talk about reducing complexity and 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 pulling down systems and and and, and so on, but I I suspect that that's not going to happen. Is is my given given the the how deeply embedded a lot of these systems are and the numbers of systems. So so is the solution going back to the fax example? The reason why you said the fax machine works is because not because you had two fax machines, but you had two fax machines following the same standards. Yeah. And that works as long as all the fax machines follow s s compatible standards. So is really our way forward that we need to be developing and sticking rigidly to um, design standards? That, that certainly would help. I mean, there is reason. You, we probably have 117 apps on our smartphones. And that's not as big a challenge or has been as a Last update of my smartphone makes me <laughs> just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, to a certain extent, I mean, it, it's an open universe, so so mm. people comply to standards, and that's a good thing because um, if a new camera app 
is similar in interaction to my old camera app, it will be easier for me to to, to make the transition to that one. So it, mm. it makes sense for a new competitor, for a new play, to sort of make it reasonably uh, similar to 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 interaction interaction mm. wise at least to to know. And that so so we have a s- quite a good I think uh, general standard between the apps here but that, that's that's that, con- that's conventions isn't it that's what we're talking about now is yeah it's conventions kind of are, are, it's, it's uh, not yeah. formal standards no yeah yes. yeah so we've, we've got a lot of established conventions that we many times adhere to yeah. um, which is a step of course away from being standards no. it's it's a good first uh, but in, in the workplace mm. especially we we don't even see conventions we see the wild wild <laughs> uh west of, of different interfaces facing mm. people um uh, and that's a problem. But we, if we could do that uh, design-wise, that would be a good thing. Um, certainly a way forward uh, to at, at least reduce some of the problems. And we would have, we would like to have standards, of course, also for for exchanging data. So, but that's even more complicated and more complex. Um, but the, I, I would I would arg- argue that there are ways to simplify things. Uh, but what history tells us is that it's only possible uh, at times of extreme danger. <laughs> yeah. It's the thing mm. that Steve Jobs did. Uh, coming back to Apple, and Apple being like two months from, from bankruptcy. Mm. And what he did was to radically sort of erase, let's skip all these products Let's mm. take away all these products. Let's like take away all these middle mm. management, and and uh, re-simplify the company. Mm. Exactly the th- same thing was done in the UK, in Britain, in healthcare. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were well, there was this huge scandal in one of the trusts, Staffordshire, I think, where they realised that, according to an inv- investigation. About a thousand people could have died unnecessarily mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of things like um, the way they organized uh, health care. Uh, things like, like <laughs> you, you had this, this rule that if people came into the, the emergency uh, room, uh, they should be treated within like seven minutes. And if there were enough people, too many people in the emergency room, they actually told the, the ambulances to drive around oh. uh, to come in later mm. so they could reach the target. There was extremely um, a management system based on targets. Uh, so these practices uh, sort of actually killed people. Uh, and the result of that was that the health secretary in the U.S., in the U.K., with with one <laughs> cut of the knife sort of scrapped you do not we cut away uh, i think a fourth of the numbers the data that you have to register the targets that you have to to uh, send into the government so we they try to l- decrease the load of of documentation and, and targets that had to be uh, reached but it's and, and and yet another example is is the um, Scandinavian airline system, the our SAS airline, which in the 1980s faced also that kind of crisis, like months away from bankruptcy, and the new boss that came in also scrapped a lot of the administration, scrapped a lot of the systems, and and actually saved the company. Mm. But it takes that urgency, it takes being on the brink of disaster mm. to to make people have the courage to um transform things as drastically as is mm. needed so so uh, but the i mean we 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 shouldn't ask for a disaster to happen well i was just thinking so we should push companies more towards <laughs> danger it's kind of the solution then but maybe not push them towards it but Make help them realize that we're already there. Yes, we're already yes. in that sense of urgency. We are in that sense yeah. with 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 the cyber mm. attacks that mm. we just spoke mm. about, and and like, I, I checked out one of the Swedish banks, and their entire mm. systems, their entire banking business mm. has been down like every at least once every month the last five mm. months. This is of course a broader challenge for 
UX, or it's, it's, mm. it's, but but it's I, I think we're we're in a good position to to um, make people aware of this, mm. um, and we certainly have a lot of allies. I mean, a lot of, of engineers and, and developers also, I think, are realizing this now. Mm. And more of us in UX we need to realize it and and take more responsibility, be more aware that we perhaps should take away more than we add. Yeah. Or stand stand firm. Yeah. Don't <laughs> don't don't give in. I don't uh, in as mm. quite as often. Mm. Um, I think it's sometimes too easy for us to give in. Yeah, but also it's too easy for us to get excited about new things <laughs> and want yeah. to build new things. Yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So much food for thought. Thank you for joining us today, Jonas Söderström. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I sound really d- depressed, down, and 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 forlorn um, after that interview in a way is it that bad yeah i I was kind of yeah but i was kind of hitting myself too jesus what am i doing what am i doing am i doing the right things and and like doubting everything but of course it's i mean it's it's what we do but it is hugely complex what we're working with so it is uh, and we're still doing the good stuff i mean we can't say that we're just doing bad stuff that's impossible no no i mean this this this, (laughs) there's this fair few there's lots of bad stuff out there as we've discussed but you know we do some excellent stuff as well and Mm -hmm. And yeah, bearing in mind that it's a very, very complex digital ecosystem we are working in. And we are, I suppose maybe we're the most sensitive because we're at the front of the pack on this one. We're the, one, we're mm-hmm. the ones that are getting kind of, you know, hurt on the front line. Or well, the users are the ones that are getting hurt on the front line. But we're, we're the ones who have the, the understanding, the empathy, I guess. Right, for this. and also the ability to make something of it or do mm. something about it. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, if we stick to our principles, if we stick to design thinking, I mean, we will learn. I mean, if we are intent on learning enough about the user situation, then I think we'll uncover all these things and we'll do better work. No, it's going to be the group hook thing again, isn't it? The stay strong. <laughs> but we're, all, we're also the ones who can, who can visualize the complexity of it all. Yeah. Who can visualize all these connections between in the integrations and, and make sure that more people who have... Uh, are in leadership roles and in management positions, understand these problems as well. Communicate. Uh, well, not just visualize, but also well, part of visualization is communication. Yeah. We communicate some of the, the um, challenges here and the benefits mm. and f- focus on the benefits. Uh, this is um, exactly. this one thing that worries me with the whole, um, you know, saving, effectivization or saving money is when you start talking about um, reducing something. Uh, isn't making something cost less, making something take yeah. less time. It it pulls you down as opposed to lifting you up. It's kind of how can how can things improve, do more of something, do things you know better, and lift things up. Exactly. So let's let's just help people understand this dilemma, and and more people will be able to do something about it. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, visit uxpodcast.com for the show notes if you can't reach them from your podcast client. And if you've enjoyed UX Podcast, now let a colleague or a friend know and encourage them to listen too. I wrote that for you, Per. And I, I realized I know, you I almost, was, you yeah, almost I said uh, reach them from your UX Podcast client, didn't you? Exactly. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this was a new... I wasn't... Do you, want, I do, you want, do, you, do you want me to read it? Do Go it. <laughs> So visit uxpodcast.com for the show notes. Um, if you can't reach them from your podcast client, then... Um, no, I see, I've done... It's badly written, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, 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 you were trying to make a point there. Yeah. The point was that you might not be able to... You might be able to see the, po- the, the show notes in the client you lo- you're looking at. Um, you might not be able to look at the client because you're driving. But you can always <laughs> get to the stuff from the website. That's kind of the point. <laughs> right. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side.